19, 1995, Timothy McVeigh took my life away. The life I had then, I don't have anymore. It was a beautiful spring day, and it should have stayed that way. But it didn't. We all changed. It felt like someone had grabbed a handful of pea gravel off of their uh, driveway and had thrown it at me. And as I found out later, that was the shards of glass from the front of the building coming through and slicing through my head and through my arms and through my body. He was an ordinary American with an all-American childhood of Little League baseball, Santa Claus, and cowboys and Indians. They were just ordinary Americans, going about their daily routines. Then, one bright spring morning in April 1995, their destinies became locked together forever. It was the worst peacetime atrocity on United States soil at that time, and it shocked America and most of the world. The perpetrator, not as was first assumed an Islamic terrorist, but a self-styled American patriot and a Gulf War hero. Using court records and other published sources, including interviews with the killer himself, together with new material, this film tells the story of the minute-by-minute build-up to this terrible tragedy as we seek to understand the mind and motives of Timothy James McVeigh, the mass murderer of 168 Americans, including 19 children. For he was no Islamist bomber from a foreign land, but one of America's own. In one hour, Oklahoma and the United States will be changed forever. Aaron and Elijah Coverdale live with their grandmother, Jenny, less than two blocks from McVeigh's target, the Alfred P. Morrow Building in Oklahoma City, which also happens to accommodate a daycare center on the second floor which the boys attend. Aaron was the smart kid, the good kid, the quiet kid. Elijah was just the opposite. That morning they hid in the kitchen. And I remember pretending I couldn't find them. And I kept saying, well, evidently they've gotten on the elevator and gone on to the daycare center. So I guess I'll just go on and leave and I could hear them laughing in the kitchen. Timothy McVeigh is 45 miles from his target and closing. That target not only houses Aaron and Elijah's daycare center, but an assortment of federal government offices. By far the largest is the Department of Housing and Urban Development. These people aren't government agents. They're simply civil servants. Susan Hunt is the department's administrative officer, and as such, the mother figure for most of the employees. Of the 124 people that were assigned to the Alfred P. Murrah building and employed by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, we were to lose 35 on that day. If I could have sat next to Timothy McVeigh the day that he drove the truck to Oklahoma City, I would have reasoned with him. First I would have said, what happened to you? Have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye. Why would you even think that killing innocent people would make a difference? Why? Um, I would also say, think, think about the good that you can do. You're a young man. I have a child the same age as McVeigh, who is a, a wonderful man. What could we as a nation do to change? 
change other Timothy McVeigh's, not to act, not to see the world so negatively. Timothy McVeigh is now just 50 minutes from taking his place in history amongst the pantheon of mass murderers. But this is no impulsive act of the moment. Should he be captured, McVeigh carries with him in the cab of his bomb on wheels an envelope he's prepared, containing newspaper cuttings, quotes, and random jottings that represent a frightening political philosophy that he's honed to a murderous edge since his teens. But his winter of discontent had once been a more glorious summer for the son of New York. I used to be an English teacher, and we would discuss what he was doing in his English class, the poetry, the, uh, the short stories, and Shakespeare. He always loved Shakespeare because they had a common birthday. He really related to younger kids very, very well. I mean, I can picture him with our son Paul on his shoulders. You know, Paul, I don't know, three, four years old, throwing the basketball toward the hoop. Um, he, um, he was a people person, there's no question. For a people person, with an all-American childhood and a love of Shakespeare. During his last years at high school, and after he graduated, McVeigh's interests and obsessions began to take a more sinister turn. He was increasingly fascinated by America's underbelly world of gun culture, survivalism, and hatred of government interference in the right to bear arms. His Bible became a shady work of fiction by former American Nazi Party official, William L. Pierce, written under the pen name of Andrew MacDonald. It tells the story of a true patriot who bombs the FBI headquarters in Washington, killing more than 700 people. If we don't destroy the system before it destroys us, if we don't cut this cancer out of our living flesh, our whole race will die. For a young, impressionable man like Tim McVeigh, who was uh, totally um, in love with the idea of the gun culture, the, the Turner Diaries was just the kind of book that he was looking for, because it was a book about gun rights, it was a book about hatred for the U.S. government, and it was also a book um, about a terrorist act. The explosion will take place in a large central courtyard. It hooked into something with Timothy McVeigh's personality that started with his love of guns. And uh, he and, and, and it inspired him to become a gun collector. And is that not a key to the whole problem? The corruption of our people by the Jewish liberal democratic equalitarian plague which afflicts us is more clearly manifested in our soft-mindedness our unwillingness to recognize the harder realities of life than in anything else. All the liberals and the Jews had to do was begin screeching about inhumanity or injustice or genocide. It was, of course, more than an anti-government book. It was anti-Semitic, it was white supremacist, and it talked about the takedown of the U.S. government. But there is no way that we can destroy the system without hurting many thousands of innocent people. No way. At the Regency Apartments, just a stone's throw away from the Murrah building, Jenny Coverdale is taking Aaron and Elijah to daycare. Timothy McVeigh is still on the freeway with 30 more miles to drive. Oklahoma's cataclysm is 40 minutes away and counting. For some reason, I cannot remember that trip. I can tell you some things that have been told to me. I had a friend that lived at the Regency. Her name was Charlotte, and she would always sit in the lobby waiting for her ride to come and pick her up to take her to work. Hi, Charlotte. Hi. Hi. 
She told me the boys always said, good morning, Charlotte. But she said, for some reason, that morning when we walked through the lobby, the boys said, goodbye, Charlotte. And I asked her, I said, are you sure that's what they said? She said, yes. She said, I thought it was strange because they'd never said goodbye to me before. But that morning they told her goodbye, like they knew they weren't coming back. McVeigh has decided that his bomb must be set to cause maximum casualties. He believes that while the government can rebuild bricks and mortar, it's only when lives are lost in great numbers that the justice of his cause, that the federal government is totally out of control, will be recognized. It's a cause that stems from his love of guns. He had his own love affair with guns, uh, which came to him through his grandfather, who, when I asked him who he loved, he spontaneously said, my grandfather, and then later his father. And when I pointed out he did not mention any of the women in his life, his mother or his sisters, he said, well, you know, I noticed that. But the only real close love relationship he ever had was with his grandfather. And his grandfather loved guns and hunting and... Tim's love of guns uh, evolved from that relationship with his grandfather. Not everyone appreciated McVeigh's love of guns as much as his grandfather. McVeigh himself later related what happened when he upset a neighbor with a shooting range he'd set up in the backyard. What the fuck are you doing, you little prick? Has that been you shooting all summer long? Do you know how close my house is back there? These rounds gonna be travel two or three miles. McVeigh loved shooting so much that he would uh, shoot at groundhogs in his father's <laughs> garden out out of his back window. So he'd actually be standing in the kitchen shooting out the window at groundhogs in his father's garden. And we actually, Lou Michelle asked McVeigh, Is, "Isn't that a bit unusual?" with all that smoke in your kitchen and the, the smell of gunfire going off in your kitchen. And he thought it wasn't at all unusual. He thought it was very normal to do that. McVeigh planned his Oklahoma operation with military precision. He talked of theaters of operation and used acronyms in army speak. Not surprising really, as he was a battle-hardened soldier. After high school and a series of dead-end jobs, McVeigh decided in May 1988 to join the army. With his love of guns, it was a natural home for him. McVeigh had very strong beliefs. And uh, he always called himself, his self-explanation was he was a survivalist. And uh, he didn't believe in big government at all. And uh, he honestly, in his mind, he, would t he told me many, many times that he thought, he didn't know exactly what it was, but something was going to happen, and you had to be ready. You had to have guns, you had to have ammo, you had to have food, water, to last you a significant portion of time. And he'd always say, at least six months, you really need a year. And he had it. He had a year's worth of all of those. Did he t you, know, you shared a room with him for a considerable time. Tell me a little bit about his political opinions, how he talked about them, did he try and convert you, that sort of thing. He really talked less, when you say political opinions, he talked in a broad range, never like specific uh, Democratic, Republican, something like that. It wasn't that. It was all broad-range, big government. You know, he just thought the government shouldn't really be involved in anything other than national defense. Yeah, he really just didn't think they should be in the day-to-day -day lives of people, that the big government should not have any power there. Did, why did he think that, do you think? I'm not sure. See, that's something he came in the Army with. He had these survivalist... Uh, opinions, and uh, when he got there, 
because I remember in basic training, and I hadn't known him maybe two or three weeks, and him talking all of it and he, you know telling how he had land <laughs> where he was going to build bunkers, and you know that came off as kind of strange. Uh, you meet some strange people when you go in the army, and uh, but with him, he was such the all-American look, clean haircut, never drank, never smoked, never cursed. I maybe heard him say two or three curse words in all those years. I mean, so his manners were so good. He was super polite, you know. So he didn't come off as a crazy. He didn't come off as, you know, somebody that was off the wall. He came off as some – he's very intelligent also. That, that's one thing you have to understand. He was a super intelligent person. He would figure things out so quick. We get a new weapon. Within three hours, he's taking it apart, putting it back together. He played little games where he'd blindfold himself and put it back together, and everybody else is sitting around trying to figure out how to put it together the first time. When we became gunners, he excelled from the start. And about a year into it, we went to a gun range, which we had to do it to qualify every year. Not only did he qualify, he got the first perfect score on that gun range with the Bradley, 1,000 out of 1,000 shots, which is amazing because if you get 850 out of 1,000 shots, you're considered a very good gunner. In January 1991, McVeigh, who was by now a sergeant and a top Bradley fighting vehicle gunner, was sent to Iraq. On day two of the ground war, he becomes a killer of men for the first time. Get that son of a bitch raghead! What'd you see that? Great shot! Why'd you stop firing? Keep firing! I got him, sir. I got him. McVeigh had killed two men more than half a mile away with one shot. What he'd done was unprecedented. After Desert Storm, McVeigh was invited to try out for the United States Army's elite special forces. This should have been the culmination of his military dream, but he failed the physical tests. This once super fit soldier was out of shape after months of inactivity in the desert. It was a cruel blow, and he resigned from the forces in disgust. Unemployed and angry, this was a man who had taken lives for his government only a few months earlier in the desert. Now he was beginning to think that he may need to take lives again, closer to home. Dear sir, politicians are out of control. Their yearly salaries are more than an average person will see in a life. At a point when the world has seen communism falter as an imperfect system to manage people, democracy seems to be headed down the same road. What is it going to take to open the eyes of our elected officials? America is in serious decline. Is a civil war imminent? Do we have to shed blood to reform the current system? I hope it doesn't come to that, but it might. Timothy McVeigh. Three years later, and the threat of bloodshed is about to become reality. In 30 minutes, McVeigh will take the final step over the edge. His victims will include men like him, Gulf War veterans working on the sixth floor of the Murrah building in a marine recruiting station. Sergeant Davis was a uh, very squared away Marine. He was married and had a little daughter that was two years old. Captain Randy Guzman, who was our executive officer, was in the building that day. And Randy was a single Marine, um, but he was um, uh, engaged to a very beautiful young lady and was looking forward to starting a, a new married life. Another person on collision course with Timothy McVeigh that day is Lou Claver a staff attorney with the Oklahoma Water Resources Board across the road from the federal building. I was working at my computer at my desk drafting up a, 
a document based on another hearing, findings of fact, conclusions of law, and drafting that up to make a recommendation on a water right to the board. And I was trying to finish that up because I had another hearing and, and uh, I was trying to catch up on my workload, just kind of a regular day. Far from it being a regular day, in just 26 minutes, Lou will unwittingly provide an extraordinary record of McVeigh's crime. McVeigh has been careful to drive at or just below the speed limit and to signal every lane change. But as he was later to tell a reporter, just as he approaches the outskirts of Oklahoma City, he finds he has an unexpected and unwanted companion on his tail. Why is he following me? I know it's not my driving. Is there a problem with the truck? If he tries to stop me, I'll run him off the road. After several miles, the cop simply peeled off, and McVeigh was free to continue his mission of death unimpeded. McVeigh's journey that ended in Oklahoma City almost certainly began to take root when he witnessed two events on television more than two years previously. You, you tell everybody how much longer will you let this go on? Wave that American flag! Yeah! Wave it! Wave it high! Randy Weaver was a white separatist accused of selling an illegal shotgun to a police informant. The 11-day siege of his cabin, following a shootout with federal agents, became a right-wing cause celeb. And McVeigh's sister Jennifer was later to tell of her conversations with her brother about what was wrong with America. Agents say they seized a cache of weapons. They say all of the firearms here are legal. The Second Amendment says we have the right to carry guns and the goddamn government doesn't give a damn. The government can go to hell. They just want to disarm us so we won't be able to resist when they come in with their UN buddies to take all us real patriots away. Think about it. How many screwdrivers does the average American have in his toolbox? McVeigh looked upon guns as like the tools of life. He, in fact, used the toolbox as a metaphor. Standard, Phillips, long handle, short. It's the same thing for guns. In your gun chest, you, you have several guns, one for hunting, for food, another for target practice, another for self-defense. Come on, ask the storekeepers in the L.A. riots if that's so unreasonable. A couple of pistols just to have, and maybe a few to trade. He figured that if the government ever collapsed, and there was no currency people could trade in guns, that guns would take on a great deal more value. And there was a point in his life where he actually started collecting guns. The feds will stop at nothing. You see, they got these crematoria. They're huge. They're going to build 130 concentration camps so they can exterminate their enemies. And that means people like me. And they're going to try and disarm us slowly. I mean, look at Ruby Ridge, Randy Weaver. McVeigh's paranoid extreme right-wing ideology came from real events and real political concerns that existed within the mainstream political discourse. However, with a conspiracist mindset and a survivalist inclination, he was able to twist these things into something that was bigger and far more sinister than the average person would think. So things like the Los Angeles riots were an example of how the society was going to hell in a handbasket and the government was ill-powered to protect decent, God-fearing citizens. It won't be long before the UN tanks are parked everywhere. I tell you, it's the New World Order and our government's right in there with them. Timothy McVeigh was not only 
a right-wing terrorist. He was also a bigot. And that really didn't come out as much in the American press during his trial. If Ruby Ridge had been the spark that lit the fuse, six months later events in Texas were to lead McVeigh directly to Oklahoma this sunny April morning in 1995. He's now on the outskirts of Oklahoma City, piloting a bomb big enough to wreak havoc over several city blocks in 21 minutes' time. Though he's inspired by an all-consuming passion of hatred of his government, the specific trigger for today's mission is a desire to avenge events 270 miles away in the neighboring state of Texas two years previously. For ATF agents, it was the day from hell. A small army of federal agents came face to face with destiny this Sunday, hoping to arrest David Koresh, the leader of the Branch Davidians, a religious cult, and execute federal weapons warrants. No warrants necessary, weapons were waiting. The siege that followed the first assault at Waco became a call to arms for anti-government crusaders nationwide and no one followed the developments more avidly than Timothy McVeigh. After a few weeks, McVeigh, who was by now living the life of a disaffected drifter in Florida, could stand being a bystander no longer. He had to go and see for himself. He had to go to Waco. After a journey halfway across America, from Florida to Texas, he never made it to the Branch Davidian compound much to his disgust. What is this? Where are you going, sir? I'm turning onto this public road and visiting the compound. Are you press? No. Then you can't visit it. Well, this is a public Turn road. Turn around, sir. So that the journey should not be in vain, McVeigh set up a stall on his car, as close to Waco as he could, selling bumper stickers. He was interviewed there by a student journalist, Michelle Rausch. So why are you here? The ATF have no right to be here. They just want a chance to play with their toys paid for by government money. The government is afraid of the guns people have because they have to control people at all times. Once you take the guns away, you can do anything with the people. He was very worried about the intense government presence on what he saw as uh, one man and his followers' uh, private life. And that was really what concerned him, how they stormed uh, the Branch Davidian complex, their continuing uh, presence there, and he thought it was a sign of more to come. You give them an inch, they take a mile. As someone who has been described as obsessed with this, he didn't come across as obsessed. He came across as very low-key, although passionate about what he believed. I believe we are slowly turning into a socialist government. The government is continually growing bigger and stronger, and we need to protect ourselves against government control. When I was talking with him, he was very articulate, very intelligent. I left that interview, again, fascinated by what he had to say, but I remember the one thing that kept sticking out in my mind was being that we were close in age, I thought it's amazing that we grew up in the same country but have completely different views of how the government is involved in our lives. Tim! Tim! Get in here! It's on fire! What the hell are you talking about? It's Waco! The feds! They've gone in! It's on fire! Holy shit! 
McVeigh was long gone from Waco when, on April 19, 1993, federal agents finally broke the 51-day deadlock there. In the fire that followed, as many as 80 Davidians, including 17 children under the age of 10, died. McVeigh watched the drama unfold with his old army buddy, Terry Nichols, and Nichols' brother, James. Still no sign of anyone coming out, Bonnie. Uh, smoke is billowing uh, 150, 200 feet into the air. Oh. Keep in mind, there's heavy, uh, there, there's heavy munitions and heavy arms in there. And also keep in mind, this is an area... What is this? Those people are dying in there. What has become of America? He told me that when he heard that the government had attacked with tanks and that the entire compound had gone up in flames, that he was overcome with an anger, a rage like he had never previously experienced. He never shed a tear for the children who died at the daycare center at the Murrah building, but plenty of tears for the, the children at Waco. It's like Hitler's Germany, fucking Nazis. Terry, we gotta do something. Two years to the day after the apocalyptic events at Waco, and Timothy McVeigh is seeing out the final minutes of the plan he began to hatch with his friend, Terry Nichols. McVeigh is determined to kill his fellow countrymen in far greater numbers than has ever been achieved by anyone, anywhere, previously in peacetime. For another Gulf War veteran, Marine Captain Randy Norfleet, bloodshed is the last thing on his mind. Norfleet is serving a tour of duty as a Marine recruiting officer, but has just left an invigorating prayer breakfast at Oklahoma City's Myriad Convention Center. After the prayer breakfast, my friend and I walked to the parking garage and uh, walked directly to my car. And we were just chatting about uh, general topics and our activities of the day when I got to my truck about 8.45. Norfleet normally works at a marine recruiting station out of town. But since he's in the city, he decides to drop in on his colleagues at the Murrah building where more than a thousand Americans are just 16 and a half minutes from tragedy. You're desperate for a smoke, I know. Take your break. McVeigh has planned every aspect of his operation down to the last detail. Together with one of his two Confederates, another army buddy, Michael Fortier, he's driven every inch of the route in advance. Checking for speed traps, highway construction, possible road hazards, but especially underpasses too low for his bomb on wheels. Whereas a government bomb, which could wreak the same destruction, would cost many hundreds of thousands of dollars to make, and even more to deliver, extraordinarily McVeigh's weapon of choice has cost less than $5,000, including the cost of the getaway vehicle afterwards. The getaway car had been driven to Oklahoma City three days before, on Easter Sunday, but this part of the plan had not gone smoothly. Where the fuck are you? Tim, I can't make it. You're kidding me. <sighs> Listen, Tim. It's Easter Sunday. Josh is here. I can't do it. You get your fucking ass over here right away. <sighs> you get in your friggin' truck now. This is for keeps. We gotta do it. Tim, I can't do it. Fuck you. Mike Forte's pulled out and now you? I'll kill you, you bastard. And your friggin' family. I'll be there. Tim? Yeah. Listen, 
uh, Tim's got my old TV he's brought from Vegas. I've got to go get him in Oklahoma City and, and bring him back you know here. No, it's my last day here before I go to Mom. I can come with you. I can't do it, son. It'd be too uncomfortable in the truck with all three of us. Me. McVeigh had already been let down by his other co-conspirator, Michael Fortier, who'd got cold feet as the day of the bombing had approached. Fortier had a wife and young family, and ultimately was not prepared to risk his life for McVeigh's plot. Nichols also had a family, of course, but McVeigh knew he couldn't do it all on his own. If he had to get nasty to keep Nichols on side, so be it and ultimately McVeigh's threats were just too powerful for Nichols to bail out. During his earlier reconnaissance mission, McVeigh had chosen an out-of-the-way parking lot to leave his getaway car a few hundred yards from the Mora building. With three days to go to the bombing, the car was parked, ready and waiting. In some American states, cars only have one license plate, at the back. Before he left, McVeigh removed this rear plate, just in case anyone should try to trace the car in the three days that it would be parked unattended before the bombing. It was an act of caution that was ultimately to be his death warrant. As he made his getaway later, for some reason he never replaced the plate, and less than two hours after his crime, he was picked up for this small infringement by an alert highway patrolman. For all his meticulous planning, his arrest for the petty misdemeanor would lead him to the execution chamber six years later. Let's go. Timothy McVeigh was not a suicide bomber as such but he had developed an indifference to life, his own in particular. Like the hero of his favorite book, The Turner Diaries, he had decided that his cause was more important than either his life or that of his fellow Americans. Although to McVeigh this was a combat mission, the envelope which he'd prepared earlier and carried with him would tell the world what he believed and why he'd carried out this ruthless crime. The package contained random jottings, selections from his bumper sticker collection, quotes about liberty from Winston Churchill, John Locke, Samuel Adams and Thomas Jefferson amongst others, and a copy of the Declaration of Independence, on the back of which he'd written the defiant threat to the politicians he so hated. Obey the Constitution and we will not shoot you. McVeigh's chosen attire for the bombing just had to be his favorite Patriot T-shirt, the one he had got when he briefly joined the Ku Klux Klan. The Latin inscription on the front contains the words shouted by Abraham Lincoln's assassin as he shot the president, thus ever to tyrants, while the back contained McVeigh's favorite quote from Thomas Jefferson, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. In addition to the blood of patriots and tyrants, McVeigh is to spill the blood of hundreds of his fellow citizens, including small children. When I think of Elijah and Aaron, I think of all the good times we had and how much I miss them. You have to realize they were my second chance raising children. I'd raised my boys. I could see some mistakes I'd made, and I was determined I wasn't going to make those mistakes with them. 
This is the moment for which Timothy McVeigh has planned for nearly two years. Just after 8.54 a.m., he stops to light the first of two fuses. A massive explosion is now inevitable. The bomb contains 1,200 pounds of highly volatile nitromethane fuel, which McVeigh has purchased from a racetrack in Texas, posing as a motorcycle racing enthusiast. This is to be mixed with nearly 6,000 pounds of simple ammonium nitrate fertilizer he and Terry Nichols had legally bought in stores. And finally, the lethal cocktail will be detonated with explosives and fuses they've stolen from a quarry in Kansas. This is taking too long. Well, why would you mark up what we need on the barrels? Yeah, good thinking. Close the door. If they come near, I'll shoot them. Close up the back door, too. Fortunately for Richard Wall and his son, they did not investigate the strange goings on in the rider truck at Geary Lake that day. McVeigh's first fuse, which he estimates will take five minutes, has been burning for three minutes already. At 8.57.05, the security camera in Jenny Coverdale's apartment block catches McVeigh's truck as he stops to light the second backup fuse. Although both fuses burn longer than he's planned, the countdown to catastrophe is unstoppable. In less than five minutes, the name Oklahoma City will become inextricably linked with the words bomb and terror. I came to uh, the stoplight in front of the Murrah building. As I was stopped there at the red light, I noticed a yellow rider truck sitting in front of the, the Murrah building. And I began to wonder, why is it there? Because there were no other cars parked on that side of the street. And it was a loading zone, it was a no parking zone. And I, uh, there, the truck was not open and no one was unloading anything. And so I thought it very peculiar that the truck was parked there. A young man stepped out of the vehicle, closed the door and ran across the street. pulled up and I parked in front of the Yellow Rider truck and walked into the Murrah building. Normally, the building is very busy and it, it takes a while to get an elevator. But on this morning, there was no one in the lobby and there was an elevator with its doors open waiting for a passenger to walk in. As I got to the sixth floor, I walked directly into our operations office Captain. Sergeant, long time no see. I know, sir. Hey, Captain, would you mind calling headquarters? You know the board met about my promotion yesterday, and the results are out, but they're not yet posted. Sure, Sergeant. Thank you. Sergeant Davis had worked very hard, and his family had sacrificed very much for him to make this jump and promotion in the Marine Corps. So I immediately called headquarters Marine Corps. Sergeant, the line was busy, but give me five or ten and I'll try again. I just need to talk to Captain Guzman. Maybe later. designated by the nine 
Ranking Member Water Resources Board to service the hearing examiner on this matter. With regard to this proceeding, basically uh, four there are elements four that I have to uh, receive information regarding. In What's the electricity line? My whole world went dark, and I could hear what was going on, but I could see nothing, and it fractured my skull, broke my nose, and left me bleeding, unconscious with two open arteries on the floor, on the sixth floor of the Murrah building. I was in the hospital for two days, and as the recovery efforts began to go on, I watched it intently, and one day we noticed that all the machinery there had stopped, and the whole uh, site it became very quiet because they had found a Marine and that was Sergeant Davis and they found Sergeant Davis and they were able to identify him by the red blood stripe that all Marines proudly carry on their dress blue uniforms and next to him not but two or three feet away was Captain Guzman and he was still holding on to the same phone that I had been holding on to 10 seconds before, sitting behind the same desk that I had been sitting behind not but 10 seconds before. Sergeant Benjamin L. Davis did get his promotion, but did not live to know about it. On that day, to lose these precious souls, to lose the folks that had had so much to give the world and sought tomorrow so aggressively. Um, it, it's just so unbelievably sad to know that Linda Florence will not hold her little boy that she wanted so bad and finally had. Um, it's so sad to know that Teresa Lauderdale, um, I never saw their faces before they died. Susan Farrell and Mike Weaver, Don Burns and Lanny Scroggins, George Howard and Tony Reyes. If I could have gathered them all up and taken them back to my office, I would have, but I couldn't, and I know that, and I've learned to deal with my grief of living and my guilt of living. April 19th, 1995 was a typical morning. I thought I was going to get off work that evening and go pick Aaron and Elijah up. But when I dropped them off at the daycare center that morning, I didn't know that I would never see them again. I didn't get to see them after I dropped them off. My sons wouldn't let me see their bodies. That's how bad they were. I don't know where God was. I've asked him that over the years. I've screamed at him. I ask God to just let Aaron and Elijah be alive. And for some reason, my prayers weren't answered. And my counselor had me to write a letter to Aaron and Elijah. And I explained to them why I didn't go back to the building to pick them up that evening. I explained to them about Timothy McVeigh, what he did to them, and why they were in heaven with Jesus. I also told them I would never stop loving them. Timothy McVeigh was stopped for a minor motoring offence less than two hours after his bomb exploded. 
he'd not replaced a number plate on his getaway car. He was then arrested for having an unlicensed firearm. Two days later, just before he was due to be released, the FBI connected him to the atrocity. Timothy James McVeigh has been executed by lethal... Six years on, he was executed by lethal injection at 8.14 a.m. on June 11, 2001, after a final meal of two pints of mint chocolate chip ice cream. The horror for the United States, for all of us that were involved in the Murrah Building bombing, was that this young man was from the United States. And so instead of fearing the unknown, it brought to the United States a fear of our own, which is a very, very scary thing. Timothy McVeigh, to me, is worse than the Middle Easterners that ran at flew those planes into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon because Timothy McVeigh was an American. Americans don't do things like that. <laughs>